ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Paula Quintella was born in Santiago, the capital of Chile. She was just a little girl when a military coup installed General Pinochet as dictator. And overnight, everything changed for Paula and her family. Paula escaped into art, creating the world in the way she felt it. The nuns at her school were not impressed when Paula painted the grass blue and the sky red. But she had seen the skies go scarlet at sunset and the grass turn blue with frost. Later, at art school, Paula survived some close encounters with the military regime. And eventually, she made a new life, way across the Pacific Ocean, in Brisbane, where she's still making art out of the world she sees around her. Hi, Paula. Hi. You grew up in Santiago. Who lived at home with you? Very strange family. We live in two houses connected by a gate in the backyard. So my father married first and had three kids. And then my mother had two kids from the first marriage. And then they got married. They put the five kids together. They had my sister and I, but also the two grandmas live with us. And many times my cousins will stay because they were studying and stay in our house. And so it was really a strange house. We, the kids we were all different colors <laughs> because my father's first uh, wife was a lot darker and, and shorter. And so they, they were like this type of kids. And, the, and then my sister and I were sort of blondish when we were little. And it was just the nuns will pull their hair out. It's just <laughs> so unusual for Latin America. That was totally wrong for them. And you had two houses. Was that just to fit everybody to in? To fit everybody. So, so where would you sleep? Uh, I will move from house to house. <laughs> so the, the gate was like a, a secret garden gate, a beautiful, like full of flowers. And I, the little house in the back was for to fit my mother's kids and the big house that was an architecture design house by my father will fit his kids and my mother and him but then uh, my sister and I will move from house to house I ended up when I was a teenager living in a in the laundry in the back (laughs) there was a little room where the laundry was and I I decided I was going to live in the middle. That's going to be your space. Yes. That laundry, you claimed it. Yes. What were mealtimes like with so many people? Oh, uh, it was like a hotel, like everyone will eat when they got home. And uh, I had a big brother, the, old, the oldest one. He was almost two meters tall and big and played rugby. And he will sometimes come first and eat the, the food from everybody. And you will open the pot and it will be a note said. Is this a ticket? You can exchange it by f- for food <laughs> in the end of the month. <laughs> and you will see. Oh, it was so funny. It, it was like a, a strange family, but fun. And you say these the two grandmothers lived yeah. with you as, yeah. as well. What were they like? What are your memories of them? Oh, I, I love them both, but they were so different. One of my grandmothers, my father's mother, came from Spain with her husband running away from the Civil War. And she was really uh, refined and she played opera and sang and um, she was really beautiful and she was a dressmaker. And so I I used to go into her room and be fascinated by the scissors and the patterns and all that and have these beautiful conversations with her. And the other grandma was the sweetest little lady ever. She she grew up in the country and she will protect me and make sure I will eat and make sure I I, I was safe. And uh, How would she feed you, Paola? Um, I didn't like eating very much, so I, I had a tricycle and she will 
sat in the chair and I will ride around my tricycle and she will wait for me with a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> so she made sure, that doesn't, doesn't matter how, but she will make sure I eat. Yeah. How did these two grandmothers get on with one another? Not really. I, I never saw them talking. Like they, they live in their own houses. They have their own life. Were there ever big arguments, big dramas in this busy household? All the time, all the time, but sort of the boys will play pranks on the girls, like the girls were, they all have similar age. Like my sister and I, my younger sister and I, we were way younger, we were the babies when this, so all the the big family were together and the girls were getting ready to go out and they, they couldn't find their clothes oh, and they, the boys would have put it in the freezer and all the jeans were frozen and they couldn't go out or, or they they will hide the shoes on the roof or the boys would get into bed and there were rocks at the end of the beds because the girls would... So there was always like noise and, and uh, girls running around. But I think it was a happy relationship. Mm. So there were lots of growing ups keeping an eye on you mm. at home. What did your mum and dad do for work? They were both architects. And they were not, never home. They worked long hours. So I remember growing up pretty much with nannies or my grandmothers. This um, was the 1970s. How unusual would it have been in Chile for a, a woman to be an architect? Oh, uh, my mother was a pioneer. She said that um, she was born in a time in Latin America where women were educated to be at home, to be a good wife like her mother. And uh, she was incredibly smart and, and she wanted to be a doctor like her father. And the father said, my grandfather said, no, women don't go to uni, don't be doctors. And she said, if you don't allow me, I'm going to be a prostitute. And the, she was so determined and that they said, oh, my God, if, maybe she will do it. So they allowed her to, be a, to go to architecture school. That was option number two. But she must have been one of the three or four women in the whole university studying with only males. Mm -hmm. So the the picture you're painting, Paola, is of, I mean, it almost sounds like a Garcia Marquez novel of all these people of different generations of, of noise and activity and this kind of bohemian energy that you Absolutely. were a part of. Yeah. And then on the 11th of September 1973, there was this military coup in Chile and the elected socialist president, Salvador Allende, was overthrown and General Pinochet took power as a dictator. You were only a little girl. Do you mm. have any memories of that day? Absolutely. I um, I remember the planes overflowing the house and the bombs. I could hear the bombs and the shots. And, and even though I didn't understand because I was little, I knew that something had changed forever. It's like a noise, something cracked in my parents' life and the happiness was taken away and through the years I learned as I was getting older and understanding a little bit more that there were a lot of her, their friends and my um, godmother and godfather that were in exile and other people that I knew were killed, um, a lot of their friends disappeared. My father used to have a very high uh, job, director of social buildings for the Allende government, and then he was accused of being a communist. Same with my mother. I don't understand how they didn't disappear or were not sent in exile. I don't understand how, but they we went through very tough times. We still live in the very pretty upper class sort of house, but with no money, no toilet paper, no food. Like, it was very tough for a little while until he went to work for the United Nations in Guatemala and then start sending money home and start getting a little bit better. But this lasted for all my childhood and almost the end of university. These were very dangerous times to be a dissident of, of any kind yes. in Chile. You yeah. know, thousands of civilians were tortured and killed. Were your parents involved in, in any of that kind of activity, any acts of resistance? A little bit, my mother. 
because she, even though they were not militants of uh, the social party or the communist party, a lot of their friends, and mainly they didn't want a dictator in charge of the country. So my mother used to help people to escape. She had a, a combi van and uh, she, I don't know how, without cell phones or line phones, she got messages that she needs to stop in this corner at four o'clock and we not look back. And she will go stop there and and hear the door of her van open and people jumping into the van and then closing. And she has to go into the French embassy and stop in the front door and never could look back. So she never knew who she helped. That but sounds so risky. She, it was wow. incredibly risky, but she she felt like she needed to do something. Was that something you were aware of at the time or no. only learnt later? No. It was very strange because I knew that there was something different about my family uh, in relation with the people in the neighbourhood, very middle class, cookie cutter, the nun school, every. Uh, and I knew that I couldn't open up about what it was different, but I, I could understand it very well, but I, I knew that I heard them talking about how the militaries did this and that, and then I go to the school and see all the generals dropping off their kids with the uniforms, and I went, wait a minute, this is something strange. So you were sent to a school that, that members of that military government would send their kids to. Why, yeah. did, why did your parents choose that school, do you think? I, I never understood why, because... Like we were so different, we were not religious and the school was really religious. My parents were really free-minded people, open-minded and intellectuals and the school was really, really cookie-cutter and uh, we were really brainwashed by all the thoughts and we have to sing the national anthem uh, every morning and it was really like military. military. Yeah, so I, I thought... This is strange. It's totally against what they are for. But then later on, I thought, my father probably thought that that was the best place to hide. <laughs> In plain sight, a safe yeah. place to put you. Yeah. Remove suspicion from the family, I guess, yeah. if, if that's where you're And where makes you're sense at. because being watched all the time. So how did you fit into this religious militaristic convent school what are your memories oh, of, gosh, of your I travel so much I always felt like I have an extra leg and an extra head and an extra everything I try so hard to fit in <laughs> but the harder I try the less I succeed <laughs> like like uh, this is the story I like to tell because it just reflects all my years of school like uh, it was kinder or year one, and I was painting a landscape, and the nuns realized that I have some talent because it was so realistic for that age. So they called somebody else to come and what and see the, the drawing, and it was all black. And uh, they took me to the principal, they called my mom because I was a rebel, I was this misbehaving girl that was not following instructions and blah, blah, blah. And my mom said, why did you do that? And I said, what? did you do what? I said, you, you'd ruin your drawing. You painted it black. And I said, I didn't ruin it. I took too long and the night came. <laughs> so it's underneath. So I don't understand. And I never understood like the fuss of everything I say or I did. So like, you were painting time. Somehow, yeah. Paula, that's I was incredible. There. I was there. I was in that landscape. I, wa I was in that forest. Tell me the story of, a, of that other painting from when you were a little girl, of, of painting the sky red and the oh, grass yeah. blue. Because you know that at age, like year one, the kids do the typical house and the typical grass, the line of grass and the flowers. And uh, my sky was red and my grass was blue and the, the house was like purple and all that. And um, yeah, they, they thought I had learning disabilities. <laughs> because I couldn't paint properly. You weren't painting the right way. Yeah. And I, again, I said, my mom asked me and I said, well, no, because if you look, I, we live near the mountains and the, in winter the, the grass have ice 
on top. It's and the frost. sunrise comes from the mountain, so the, the sky is red. Oh, also, with the Mother's Days, we all have to do a portrait of their to give the mother, and I draw my mother as a pirate with a gun, <laughs> <laughs> with a good leg. <laughs> she would have loved that, I she think. She loves that, but I got in trouble again. That's not mothers. The mothers are not pirates, and they don't have carry guns in a little purse. <laughs> so, stuff like that. It was a mess. Your mum and dad couldn't continue their work as, as architects after the, the coup, after yeah. Pinochet took power. So what sort of work did your mum get? Well, all her uh, brothers were engineers, so she learned. And she started doing projects as an engineer, but her brother was signed for her. So she started making calculations for power pressure in high buildings, tunnels. Are they still around in yeah, Santiago yeah, yeah, today? The dam near Santiago, she designed that. One of the longest tunnels, she calculated the air. I don't know what she has to calculate, pressure. Just self-taught how to yeah, do all of this. Yeah, and with uh, her brother, and, and he will sign. And then she started teaching. You and your mum and sister went and lived with your dad for a year while he had got this work in yes. Guatemala. Yeah. What kind of contrast was Guatemala with oh, Chile? That was the most wonderful, happiest time of my childhood. I could not believe the colours. Santiago is really dark in, in winter. It's really cold. It's like Tasmania. It's beautiful, but it's cold. And Guatemala was tropical and everything smelled like colours. And, and there were all these Indians, the Aboriginals with the huipiles and colourful dresses and, and the, they will burn incense in, in the street and People were like different, they were darker and beautiful and wear headpieces like Frida Kahlo. And I oh, was, uh, yeah, I li we live in a hotel in the city. And then on the weekends, we will go to the jungle with my father. How would you get around? He bought this most stupid yellow, bright yellow Mercedes <laughs> you can ever imagine. So we will go to these Indian towns I have never seen. A person that doesn't is not a Mayan. They speak. They don't even speak Spanish. Some of them, and there we are arriving. My father, that because he uh, when he was little and uh, he was born in the ship coming from Spain, uh, and he got tuberculosis, affect his bone. So his body was was a form. So he was shorter and has a, had a bump in the chest and in the back. So. He looks, looks different as well, but he also dressed different because he will he admired Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock so he, Holmes, yeah. <laughs> so, he, so he will. Oh my gosh! I, I my oh, I wanted to be invisible, <laughs> but he will dress in the most colorful things and oh my gosh! And drive this yellow car. I will arrive in these towns, and the whole town will come and touch us and touch the car, and and we will just ah. Oh, it was incredible, incredible. Well, you eventually moved back. The family eventually moved back to Chile. Yes. And you finished school. How did your parents feel about you going to art school? Were they happy with that? My mother was. My father um, wasn't so much. I, but then and he, yeah. Oh, like your mother, that you were not going to be dissuaded from pursuing this. No, exactly. This. No, it was the only thing I wanted. I didn't... Uh, applied to anything else. If it didn't work, I was going to try again, but I wasn't going to do anything else. And did you find your tribe, your like-minded students, once you began at art school? No. I was dreaming that it would happen, but I, I found something really confronting because the, the school was divided. It was really politicized. There was a battle against Pinochet. It was very political. And there was one half that was a hippie and the other half were all punkies and I was none of the above. And I was confronted with very, very intelligent and intellectual kids that I, I was, because I went to the cookie cutter school. And so I, I had to catch up. It was really... Um, beautiful because pushed me to to read and learn quickly 
to catch up with all these kids. I knew so much. And how did you change the way you looked or acted to catch up with these more sophisticated art school students? Well, the first year I tried everything. So I went from my honey colour long hair to I shaved one side and shaved the other side and my hair was blue and then was <laughs> white and then I was shaved completely and, and it was so... I got so much aggression in the street because people were not used to seeing anything different. Will just attack me and and say terrible things and uh, point me with the finger. And so taking the bus to go to classes was terrible. And I, I, it was too much for somebody that wants to be invisible. So I realized that, yeah, no, I I start going back to being myself. Part of yourself, which I guess maybe distinguished you from from many of the other students at art school was your passion for ocean swimming. How did that start? Well, I always did that. Again, I tried to be fit in. And again, I was the only person in the whole university that practiced sport, a high-level sport where nobody swim, nobody did anything. They were all like so intellectual, that's it. And I went classes in the morning, stay all day painting, and then in the afternoon I will take my bag and go training every day. And swimming training in the ocean itself no, or in pools? during the week was in the pool, like normal training. Uh, and every weekend we will go to the ocean. The ocean is freezing cold, but I just loved it. Freezing cold, of course it is when I think about where Chile is. Yes. Like that's southern and ocean. And I never wear a, a wetsuit because I wanted to feel the currents to be... Like I, I swam 1,500 or three kilometers and uh, it's half of the strength and your training, but also orientation. You have to ha- find high points so to, to find your way. So there's, you're not following a boat. You are following your own orientation. They're, the boats are there to pick you up if, if you are in trouble, but you have to find your way back to the finish line. So it was really challenging, but uh, so you wouldn't wear a wetsuit so you could feel the current. Of, yeah, of although the, water. the girls will wear a sea lion fat on the bodies or wetsuit, but I always felt like I, I wasn't free with that. So I, and I was the skinniest, <laughs> the skinniest of all of them. They were really strong and big, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> What was it like being in, in the ocean for you? What are your memories of actually being well, in the sea? The ocean in South America back there is black. It's black and it's cold and there's big, strong currents. They drop us in the imaginary line. They shoot the gun and you, have, you are on your own. And I always thought it was fascinating going into like the womb, like you will hear that noise, choo, 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 choo. So it was me and my music that rhythm in my head and nature. I always kick really hard at the beginning so I wouldn't see anyone else. And I swam on my own and it was like meditating. Beautiful. How good did you get, Paula? Well, I was the Chilean champion for a long time. Yeah, I was. I was for a long time. Pinochet had been in power for, you know, coming up to two decades by yeah. this point. And this was a time also of, of protest, of violent protests. Yeah. Yeah. What experiences did you have of, of street protests against the well, Pinochet regime? Again, that was part of my life. The worst one, the last one, was when I was with the whole university protesting outside the museum because Pinochet had nominated a director of the university nominated by him. So that was the last drop of controlling the minds, controlling the opposition. Like, I'm going to put somebody there that will cut any neck of people against me. So everyone went out. We were all protesting pacifically. But then I heard some shots and I realized that one of the music students had been shot in the head. Uh, Maria Paz Santibáñez. She lives in Europe now. She, she survived. She, she survived, but I thought she was dead. She's a pianist. But I froze, and a friend of mine grabbed my arm and said, Paula, run, run. And I, if it wasn't for him, I would be, I don't know where, but I still remember the boots running behind me, the boots of the 
military guys like cock, 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 the noise of the the boots and I, I was terrified. I'm just running, running, and then I saw with the corner of my eyes how they hit him, my friend. He disappeared for two weeks and I don't know what they did to him. But I ran for hours of what felt hours and I hide in a building that I I saw an open door and when it got dark I called my mom and she picked me up but I I thought Jesus that was really really close Podcast and broadcast. This is Conversations with Sarah Konoski. Find more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. Paula, while this social unrest and political protest was going on all around you, you were focused on painting, on making art. Where did you get your supplies from in those years? Well, first, I didn't have much money to buy things. The only thing available was really like student quality oil paints, very, very poor quality, but I couldn't even afford that. So I made my own with pigments and oil and made my own and um, my own paints and my own things. I, I stretched my own canvases and there was a little shop inside the university that you can buy the the oil and the um, chemicals to dilute your pigments in little jars. So I bought little jars with a piece of cotton on the top and I bought all the the chemicals like and you that. make them up yourself. I make them that the whole way. Tell me about what happened one day when you were preparing paints like this, as you describe, and a protest was happening outside the building. It was so normal to have uh, tear gas and bombs and things. I knew there was a big one being prepared. The, the art students make a huge spaceship of paper and burn it outside in the main avenue and have this big fire and protest. And I th- I put the music really, really loud and I was painting this huge ocean paintings. Like I was so into it. I was in the ocean, this big two meters high. I was painting like eight of them at the same time. So pretty much I have a wall and I was into this la 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 music really loud. And then I, <laughs> the door opened and this military guys come with helmets and the shields and all that and boots and I couldn't see their faces and they took me because I think they thought I was making the bombs because oh. I have all the jars with the <laughs> chemicals, like home, got all the chemicals so they thought I was a bomb maker so I, they took me and, and put me in a bus with no windows I couldn't see but I, I knew that there were more people in that bus and they took us to a a place, And I was really scared because back then a lot of people were taken not to jail or to a formal place, were taken to underground houses where they were tortured and then they disappeared. So I knew, Jesus, this is it. I, I won't get out of this one. And um, in the bus I recognized the voice of one of the girls I knew that was the daughter of one of the opposition leaders, that a politician very well known. And even though he was from the opposition, I knew that they wouldn't touch him or his family. So kind of that relaxed me a little. That If you were bad, connected with her, there was a chance that you would... There was a chance there. So and, and where did they take you? What happened? I have no idea where. It wasn't a the police department, from the room I saw there was a house. They didn't beat me or anything, but I was expectations like they could rape me here or anything bad could happen. Did your families have any idea where you were? No, nobody. But uh, obviously when I didn't get home, 
my my mom and other parents start organizing themselves and I think it was through this girl's father that they found out where we were and they released us. What was that moment like? Oh, it was incredible. All the parents were outside and tears and hugs and 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 then my mom was angry at the same time, crying but angry. Angry why, at you. Yeah. <laughs> why do you like I said I didn't do anything. I, I told you I wasn't gonna do it, but yeah. She had been so scared, of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah. And I mean I guess this must be this is one of the, the things for people who haven't lived through something like this that can be difficult to wrap our heads around is alongside the the terror and the drama of what you just described, Paula, there's also just normal life in a way goes on along. And so you meet this man at university and you fall in love and you have a child. Tell me about meeting Javier. Was he similar to the men you dated before or what drew you to him? (laughs) No, not at all. I I had the previous boyfriends were all artists and filmmakers or musicians and Javier was an engineer. <laughs> ah, you're going back to family time. Yeah, when I saw him, uh, I think I was just sick of these artists around me that were as crazy as me. And, and this guy came along to hire me to take photos of the mechanical engineer school, same university. And he was like seeing one of my uncles, or like my mom, everyone. So everyone was so relieved. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Finally, a good candidate. <laughs> yeah. And his family had, he'd grown up in Canada. His family yeah. had been in exile. Was yeah. that part of the appeal in a way? Was he a ticket out of Chile for you? Probably, probably in the back of my mind. And he was really smart as well, very intelligent. And uh, his his story was really charming and the fact that he came from this very remote place almost in the North Pole and he grew up in Setil, like a little town near uh, Indian Reserve. I, I, I thought, wow, this is fascinating. And also when you grow up without seeing anyone from another country, anyone that was different, that had different experience, different upbringing was fascinating for me. And because of his family background, you managed to leave Chile and went to Canada yes. together. Yes. So was that an experience for you of finally being able to freely be an artist in a, in a democracy, a safe country for you like Canada? Did that let your art flourish straight away? No, no, because <laughs> it was kind of somehow because he was studying I was helping him to study, so all the resources were for him to study and he was doing an MBA and then he was working. And I was raising babies and it was the only time in my life, I think four years where I did, or three, where I didn't make any art because I was the wife, I was the mom, I was this person that didn't speak English and... It was in a foreign country, different culture. I couldn't read the social codes very well because I, I didn't speak the language and I didn't have friends. And then... Um, what did that do to you, not oh, I was making dead. art? I was just dying inside. I was just... I pick up from the garbage a lot of boxes and I made my daughter a whole set of toys made out of cardboard. So she has a spaceship, she had a house, she had cars I made in papel mache, all sort of a tea sets and stuff. And all the kids in the neighborhood came to play in her house. We were the poorest of the students. All the kids have toys. <laughs> we had nothing. And But I made her like whole life of paper and she loves it. So that was the thing. Uh, but when my mom so- went to visit and she realized how dead I was, like she gave me money to do something, go back to art. So how did you find your way back into making art beyond just making craft, art and craft yeah, for your kids? Yeah, I know. As I said, uh, my mom gave me that money and said, you're not allowed to spend it in the family. It's for you to make art. 
And I said, okay, mom. So I asked people around and I found this place in the old Montreal in a very industrial area full of artists and it was a printmaking studio. So during the day, I will look after the babies, be the housewife and do all the chores and blah, 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 clean the house. But as soon as Javier came back home, I drove up the baby and I drove to, because I was in an English neighborhood, kind of in the border of uh, Montreal, but this was in the center, in the old Montreal. So snow, uh, storm, doesn't matter what was going on, I will drive there every night and go into this building that it was so like in the movies. It has boxing. You could see the window and these guys were boxing and then you climb the stairs and there was some Chinese factories of clothes and then and the smells were coming and I keep climbing. And in the top uh, floor, there was this metallic door that you will knock on that metallic door almost with a coat and, <laughs> and then they open and it was fascinating. All these printing presses and artists working and uh, it was all in French, but it was similar enough to Spanish so I could manage and uh, um, it was amazing. And that brought your life back to you? Absolutely. That generosity of these artists that were like, I was so shy, like working in this tiniest plate I could find, like so almost asking for forgiveness, like for my lack of talent. And so I'm so sorry. And like I didn't tell anyone who I was. So if I have previous studies, I was just in the back doing the tiniest little plate and they will walk beside me and say, hey, take my, do this, la la, you can share, you can use my paint to do that. And I started blooming. I started breathing again. And it took me like six months and I was shining and loving life and sharing with these generous, beautiful people and creating again. And Your mum was very wise to give you that money with that directive. It was the only thing that could save me and she knew. Your husband was transferred with his work back to Chile, but not to Santiago, up into the north, into the Atacama Desert. Yeah. What sort of landscape is that? It was surreal. Again, Garcia Marquez and all the writers that you know from Latin America, that is real. Is <laughs> Why, what images come to mind when you remember I that mean, place? I live, I have the ocean in front and the Atacama Desert in the back. It was a port, so it was the driest desert in the world, but it's such an, a place of contrast. I was in a little neighborhood of expats, so everyone was Canadian or Australian or American, all the housewives were like <laughs> scissor hands, kind of <laughs> like all beige, and then you come out and it's like, Incredible, vibrant, and um, people from the north and all sunburn and uh, the music and the, I loved it. I loved it. And weird enough, I learned that it was in that place that my grandparents arrived from oh, from Spain, from Spain, and my grandfather that ended up. My grandmother always told me he was dead, but actually he wasn't dead. He had three families at the same time. So he, the last family he, where he died was there. Oh, wow. In that place. So there were another family that he created there because it wasn't internet or anything. So he could have, he traveled a lot and have families everywhere. Did you meet any of them? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, buying something in the supermarket and I pay with my credit card and they a person behind me grabbed it and said, you are one of us. And they knew the story. And we went outside and said, what do you mean? And he told me that they knew about us in Santiago and they knew that he made another family in Valparaiso. <laughs> and he had them. And they all looked like my brothers. It was so crazy. How incredible. And, and you told the rest of your family? Yeah, and he was years. buried in the cemetery there in, in Antofagasta a whole revelation and life took me to that place again. 
And then the next place that it took you was maybe even a stranger surprise when your husband said, now I'm being transferred to Brisbane. Yeah, I said, no way. No way. I had enough. I finally back in Santiago. I have a studio to die for in the most beautiful area near the Cerro San Cristobal. It's a very artistic neighborhood. I had an old house shared with 10 other artists. I was having the time of my life. I was being represented by a, a gallery. I went to the Art Fair of New York. I, I was, everything was going on. And then he goes, no, we are going. I said, no, no. But then I came for a few weeks just to get to know Brisbane and decide then. And I loved it. Why? So, what did you love? I guess it reminds me a little bit of the tropical Guatemala and the, the birds and the trees. Yeah. You continued your art practice here in Australia and were selected for the Portugal Biennale. Tell me about the work you made for that show. Uh, well, that was, yeah, one of the, another one of my very traumatic experience because my, my work is, um, I do a more conceptual line of work, the installations, and I, within that conceptual uh, line of work, I create this house. The first house was in Antofagasta. They invite me to, uh, with six artists from different parts of the world, to talk about immigration. So the first uh, uh, installation I made, I made it in that pier where my grandparents arrived. Mm. I made a house that was a greenhouse full of pillows. It was called Intransic. We are an immigrant that you are never, you don't belong to anywhere. You are always in transit because you you leave your place of origin, but you are never fully from the place you adopt as a new place. You're always going to be a, an immigrant. So I create this very fragile house that have full of pillows and the pillows have images of objects that when you're a woman, all the things that are passed from woman to woman in a family, like that little box, the little teddy bear, or the blanket that grandma made, or all those little things that are not necessarily had a value in money, but they are those things that talk about your identity, you leave them behind because you, you just take a suitcase with you. So I made in pillows all these images, and that was the first one. And... Uh, through that work, they invite me to this Biennale in Portugal. So I made a different one. It has the pillows as well, printed pillows. But the house, instead of plastic outside, had this fabric. And I hand sew all the letters that my father sent me when he was in exile. In one side and in the other side, all the letters that my mother sent me when I was in it, outside. <sighs> so much work, It took Carla. me a year. I roll it all up. I arrived in um, Madrid first, and the trolley that was attached to the work came along with all the tags, and the work was gone. Well, so it came out of the, the, the luggage carousel, carousel yeah. the, the trolley, but not the artwork. Exactly. And I went like, what? What happened? I talked to a million people. I wrote so many letters. They said that they were look for it in maybe Dubai or somewhere. Oh, it's always in Dubai. They always, always say Dubai. Dubai. And it's always in Dubai. And <gasps> they couldn't. And I said, okay, I have to keep traveling to oh. Portugal. Every place I stop, I call them back and they say, we haven't found it yet. I arrived at the museum where there was the most gorgeous modern museum in Douro where the Biennale was going to be, and there was literally a square on the floor in the lobby of the museum <laughs> with the Paula Quintela in transit. And the work never arrived. It got lost in transit. <laughs> There's a terrible poetic it was beauty so poetic. to that, but how, how did you recover? That must have been so devastating. Well, the good thing is I've gone through so much in my life that I decided that I had two choices. Or I cry the rest of my life, or I get drunk. <laughs> and I did get drunk. 
<laughs> and then the next day after I recover, <laughs> I start traveling through Portugal and I had the best time, the best time. I, and I, it was so terrible, but uh, yeah, I had the best time. Hmm. But uh, back in, in Brisbane, I, a year later, I started working in another house that is a ghost house. It has no structure, has no bones, has the poems, but everything is threaded and the images are printed on the canvas. So they're like uh, ghost images of mm. that purse, the scissors, all those objects that I left behind that I'm supposed to have. But then I can't. Where were you living when the Pinochet dictatorship finally ended? I was still living with my parents. And what do you remember about, about that time, about what the country felt like? It was a very, uh, like a big celebration and incredible, but it was weird because... At the same time, all the people in my neighborhood and my school, I had like two lives. There was a lot of anger because I think Pinochet, and this is what dictators do, they brainwash people. So there was a lot of people that I love and I appreciate that they were in my life, but they totally ignore what happened. They think it was a lie because TV... Radios, newspapers, everything for years was controlled. So they really think I'm lying. They thought that these were like these terrible communists that were coming here to eat the babies and who knows what else. You managed to make this whole adult life for yourself after the end of the regime. But yes. of course, the years of the dictatorship really stole your parents' professional Life. They stole their adulthood. Yeah. How did they recover after the end of the dictatorship? I don't think they recover. I think that changed the, their life forever. There was a nostalgia in my mother, the sadness in the back of her mind that it never went away. Uh, my father always, I think, thought about the brilliant past he was going to have as the good architect he was and how those, all those dreams were destroyed and the friends that were no longer there and the horrors of the torture and all the stories that start coming up because when Pinochet went, they start finding the bodies. They start finding the stories. The truth start coming off float. So that was even more terrible because things that they sort of knew became reality. All these stories start freely coming out. So my mother, at the end of her life, she got the Jack of Croth, uh, the mad cow disease. Mad cow disease, okay, which has a dementia, hallucinations yeah, come yeah, with that. Yeah, it's a virus that affects your brain. So for a year she was sort of dying and then recovering, dying and recovering, but she was hallucinating. My family has such a black sense of humor. I'm totally the daughter of my father, but she got obsessed that I was the daughter of this doctor that she loves so much. And she will say, Paula, you are here finally. Come and the proof that you are his daughter are on top of the TV, the papers. And there was no TV and no papers. So my, my brothers and sisters were like, oh, that explains everything. <laughs> Because I am so different to all of them. Ah, oh, that explained everything. I said, Paula, go and grab it. I said, just, just shut up. <laughs> and I said, Paula, but Paula, go and grab it. And they will like laugh at me and she will get obsessed. But what happened with that doctor is that he was a doctor much older than my mother that she really loves. And they, they tortured him. And the last time anybody saw him was in the National Stadium, Estadio Nacional, hanging in a cage, one by one cage. That was the last time anybody, anybody saw he, that, that person. And my mom got so traumatized by that, that in her dementia or her hallucination, he came back into this story. Mm. So I, I made an artwork to make peace with that, where there's a man in a little cage. The, the weird thing 
in my artwork is that when you see it, it's very colorful, except for the sculptures that are straightforward terrible. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the paintings are really pretty. Yeah, they are. They are really pretty, but they are hidden things that are really terrible. And there's one painting that has a beautiful volcano that is a reference to Guatemala with the active volcanoes and the jungle. And there is a little gold cage. And in the gold cage, there is a man. And you hardly can see it because there's so much colors and explosion of happiness, but he's hanging there. You've made art in so many places, in that little school where the nuns were cranky at you, in Montreal, in the Atacama Desert. What is your studio like now? The studio I have now is the prettiest of all because it has a window that look at the creek and the trees and the trees are Brisbane trees but I think at this point of my life there are all the trees I have seen in my life they have become I don't make I sometimes go in these landscapes awards and it's funny because I look at the other pieces that are from Australian artists and they're beautiful technique and they're really super realistic and stuff. And I realize that I don't paint, paint what I see. I realize I paint what I feel. So they're a combination of my memories and the, the trees are alive. They have eyes. <laughs> they have hands. The trees are myself and the trees are the people I had left behind, and the trees are my life. Paula, I've really loved getting to hear your story. Thank you so much for being my guest on Conversations. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. This is Conversations with Sarah Kanofsky. Hear more Conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. That conversation was produced by Alice Moldovan. Our executive producer is Carmel Rooney. And Conversations is created on Gadigal, Turrbal and Yagara land. I'm Sarah Konoski. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Sarah Konoski. For more Conversations interviews, head to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.